question. Let me comment right now about the debt crisis, this second crisis, as this first crisis now wanes. Uh, the second crisis, the debt crisis, uh, of course, is what is the major concern in front of us today. So the second crisis uh, was really uh, not a crisis three, four years ago. How did this happen? How did suddenly we have European, European Union, the, the Euro, a, a, a worldwide crisis potentially pulling down the overall global economy. Did, do we know about this three or four years ago? Well, we have known, of course, that Greece is a problem for some time, and we've known that Italy is a problem for some time. But actually, the Italian debt is not that unreasonable. It's only 3%, the deficit, and uh, over the next three years, if in fact if it contains spending by 1%, it's absolutely doable. So their deficit is not that difficult to deal with. Greece is a very significant problem, there's no doubt about it. But the real problem is Spain. Spain, there's no way, Spain and Italy, there's no way of bailing out Spain and Italy. In some ways, we don't need to bail out Italy. There, one can put into place a reasonable fiscal policy of constraint going forward. The real unknown is Spain. And the Spanish uh, crisis is another version of the subprime crisis. Spain and Ireland and the UK and Iceland, but that's not part of this discussion right now, did not have financial instability. We're not under financial threat. They did not have deficits. Their federal spending was in balance with their tax revenues. They neither had debt nor deficit that would set off any alarms. What happened was the debt in Spain and in Ireland became a significant problem when the banking sector had to be backstopped and the overall economy went into recession and revenues declined and uh, taxes uh, um, insufficient to cover this. How did this happen? Just as the subprime crisis was begun in real estate, so was the Spain crisis in Spain, so was the crisis in Ireland. Now, this is not the only times uh, we have been in the banking system. Now, the interesting thing is that the banking system in Spain, uh, the, the commercial banks, is actually not in that good shape. They have something uh, uh, which is called dynamic provisioning, which is, in fact, a potential tool and one of the lessons learned from macroprudential policy. Dynamic provisioning, which was only used in Spain and only in the commercial banking sector, um, argued for increasing reserves when housing and real estate prices increased beyond fundamentals. And it was noticed and detected by the, um, over the central bank in, in uh, Spain that housing prices and real estate prices, and land prices in particular, were out of line with historical ratios. And therefore, they imposed on the commercial banks, and the commercial banks themselves were willing to, in fact, do this dynamic provisioning. And the dynamic provisioning was then discussed throughout Europe, because of course there were other, uh, including uh, 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 other uh, countries where housing prices were increasing. In fact, the housing price increase was global, it's certainly throughout the OECD, but it was rejected by other central banks uh, in Europe, and we can come back to why that was the case. But it saved the, it saved the commercial banking sector in Spain, but unfortunately not the Cajas. Cajas, which was Spain's savings and loans, were heavily expensed to real estate. And there was no dynamic provisioning. There was, in fact, just the opposite. There was a pulling in of financing through a new securitization instrument. Similar to the US, the securitization instrument in Spain brought in capital from throughout the world to the Cajas to very poorly underwritten loans. OK, now let's go to the underwritten loans. So again, in these countries, we have the real estate, the debt cycle, but in this case, the banking sector. So let's go to the poorly underwritten loans. Who's purchasing them? Spain's loans, US loans. Who are the investors that are purchasing them, and why are they purchasing them? Are the investors totally blind? In many cases, yes. In many cases, it's the people who are relying entirely on the credit rating agencies. And the credit rating agencies are giving triple A to these securities based on today's current prices being correct just like the banking system, taking appraised values and saying they are reflective of fundamentals. These are AAA, and as long as prices don't fall, they're AAA. In addition to that, uh, there are loan tapes. So the loan tapes, which investors who are knowledgeable could look at, 
the loan tapes had in them loan-to-value ratios. But they had loan-to-value ratios of the book of business of that specific mortgage-backed security or that specific CEOs. There was no one who was looking at the entirety of the book of business. This is why there's now, as part of Dodd-Frank law and macroprudential policy, a new uh, division, the Office of Financial Research, which is looking to collect for the first time all of this data to have the sense of the exposure of the shadow banking system, the entire set of books. But not only wasn't the entire book of business the fact that this uh, credit was being expanded across the board at such a fast rate, and particularly in some markets. But in addition, what we didn't know is we didn't know the debt to income ratio. That was not reported anywhere, not on the right tapes. Why not? And not in the uh, loan tapes that were provided from Spain either. Why not? Because it was felt that as long as housing prices rose, these would repay. So just look at loan to value ratios credit score, that's easily, you can easily look at credit score, look at loan to value ratios based on current values, and we will assume housing taxes will continue. What do we need to know about debt to income? It's not, you can always sell your home, you don't have to foreclose as long as prices are rising. So what was not known was a few things in any of these securitized mortgages in Spain, in the US, anywhere. one, debt to income ratios, two, loan to value often was uh, fraudulently, or even in current values. The, no one was validating the data. In many cases, the data were missing and not validated. Third, uh, we didn't know, uh, in terms of summary information on the tapes, the distribution of loan to value and other characteristics of loan. So it really matters whether the average loan to value is 60%, because on average, everyone has 60% loan to value, or the average is 60% because 20% have a loan to value of 110%, which is definitely going to go bad, and the rest have very low loan to value. So this is absolute, and this is what the Fed is not tracking, no one is tracking, because it couldn't be tracked. Okay. So I believe going forward, although we don't have the legislation or regulation, I should say, yet in place, that um, these will be tracked. But even if we do track these, uh, we really, from an economist's perspective, don't understand the uh, real estate market dynamics and how they relate to debt. So there has been, um, and I will speed up now, but uh, there's been considerable work on asset pricing and housing demand and credit cycles, some of which I've done. There is a literature, a developing literature, which uh, those of you who are uh, interested, I share with you, since I can't go uh, through this in great detail. This is a, this is a paper that I uh, will make available based on paper that I am developing. But there is research by, uh, to begin with, as we say, Cash and Schiller on the importance of backward-looking expectations, and then work by Joe Jurko and colleagues Albert Saiz at the uh, Wharton Real Estate uh, uh, Department on uh, supply and elasticity, because supply and elasticity is tremendously important if there's an increase in demand in whether prices will rise. They will rise in elastic markets, if not other markets. And that's why in the United States, we really didn't have a national boom. We had a boom that was in you know, about one third of the United States, where housing prices, where housing markets were, real estate is quite inelastic. But through much of the world, housing and real estate supply is inelastic. So understanding that the, in the supply elasticities is key to the evolution of easing debt constraints, increasing demand, and the sustainability of, uh, of price increases because. The dynamics matter in supply elasticity. There may be short run, very uh, little elasticity, and longer run, greater elasticity, which then builds in a price rise and price decline. So looking at these dynamics is one issue. Another issue, which is subject of, of significant research, and I'm doing some work on this as well, is the role of credit constraints on, on demand and on excess volatility in prices. For example, a paper by Artello Magne and Reddy demonstrate that credit constrained first time buyers uh, do produce price overreactions relative to income growth. Um, uh, work by uh, myself with Andre Pavlov uh, that was uh, actually started here, find uh, using uh, Granger causality that uh, higher concentrations of mortgage lending result in all else equal, greater prices, particularly price to rent ratio, um, 
and subsequent declines. Mian and Sufi, in an important series of work, explain how this is only possible because the volume of credit uh, being supplied uh, uh, through securitization uh, reflects the underlying uh, unstable uh, price rises. Okay, are there actual, potentially actionable variables that could signal beforehand that a bubble is in process? Really, that's the question. And the answer is that probably there must be. Not perfect, uh, but better than we've done. Uh, an important paper here by Getz and Peng and Young, looking at the acid bubbles of the past, concludes that, quote, the rate of model failure should give grounds to set up confidence bounds. So market failure in terms of uh, model failure, that is the inability to explain the housing price evolution, uh, in many markets across time, using the fundamentals should set off the alarm. So this is the basis for uh, a set of tools. Pavel and Walker in another paper showed that this error term structure uh, or these uh, fundamental ratios that are uh, not consistent with history, uh, prices to rents, let's say, or prices to income, let's say, to be simple about it, when this correlated with debt, which is also com uh, compressed pricing. So that is where risk of debt pricing is also compressed over time, is a signal that capital markets are not, in fact, pricing in the risk of price declines uh, that are being indicated by the real estate signals. None of this is perfect, but um, yeah, some are suggesting, and in fact, so far gov some governments, which I'll come back to, are taking these signals. Uh, to uh, use for actionable, uh, uh, actionable steps. Um, so let me talk about some of these actionable steps that are being both happening and in the literature. Car uh, Carson and Dastrup in a paper in 2011 uh, recommend linking a loan to value ratios to price appreciation. That's being done in Canada right now, and of course it uh, has just been done in uh, China, it's been done in Korea. Uh, and I understand, uh, so that's using uh, discretion on loan to value ratios. Um, and also, there's a uh, use, I understand, right here in Singapore, of uh, taxes, uh, increase in stamp taxes to tamp down the uh, budding bubble. Uh, in, um, in Hong Kong, uh, loan to value ratios also used, my understanding is not particularly successful. Uh, in um, Korea's, again, uh, debt-to-income ratio uh, tools have been used, highly controversial. And of course, in China, uh, the restriction of mortgages uh, only on two homes and uh, the restriction in loan-to-value ratios, which may have, in fact, pricked that bubble. From my perspective, however, a more complete solution uh, would be to remediate the underlying uh, incompleteness of real estate markets which I think makes real estate particularly susceptible to uh, these crises, and particularly when um, correlated with expansion of debt. What is that underlying market incompleteness? The underlying market incompleteness is the difficulty of short selling real estate. So when prices rise due to the fact that people are constrained and are simply purchasing based on their constraint has been lowered, and this is a uh, a buy it now or buy it never um, uh, behavioral ex episode. Uh, so they're not, uh, so they're, the constraint has been uh, breached and, and, they're, um, and they're purchasing. So uh, at, at this, um, uh, at, at this, uh, in this situation, uh, the optimists and those who are constrained are setting prices. The optimists are setting prices because they believe even if they're not constrained, they believe that housing prices will continue to increase. The credit constraint that are now no longer credit constrained are setting prices, and there's a third group that's setting on the margin prices. And that is investors, perhaps, who are taking advantage of the put option, which now is once the housing prices, the option to put the loan back is in the money. That is when the knowledgeable, uh, those who are following these markets, perceive that, in fact, mortgage loans are already underwater, that real estate prices based on fundamentals will decrease, so they are forecasting loan to value ratios that will way exceed 100, and that the uh, mortgage loan will, is, it is a put option, it is in the money, are taking these mortgages, 
the lenders are booking with fees and they're putting them into securities, so we're, they're not taking the long run risk. And the borrowers is expecting to uh, either themselves take the fee in a securitization or if they are speculators to resell as the bubble continues or if not to be held to, to have the mortgage but no problem be put back to the, bank, to, the, to the bank so that it's not their own liability. So these three groups are setting the prices and at the same time the uh, no short sellers. Now that's an exaggeration to say no short sellers because in fact there were short sellers who were putting together the other side of the CDOs. And that's the uh, number of these cases that are being considered by the SEC and the courts in the United States. Folks like John Paulson and Goldman Sachs and recently City, uh, City Group um, uh, litigation that was put back by a judge um, in, in New York City uh, to the SEC where in fact one side of the deal was quite aware that these prices were out of line with fundamentals and was banking on because they were taking the other side of credit default swap default swap bets was banking on the failure. But the problem is that this actually grew the market for the other side of the CDS and the CDOs because at the same time as there were these knowledgeable folks in the market, the machine that was putting out the MBS and the CDOs was selling to many, many uninformed or not just uninformed but those who believed that they were protected by the CDS that they were purchasing from uh, the uh, from from the from the uninformed. So, in sum, macroprudential policy is, I believe, uh, very much uh, a matter of just like um, inflation is a monetary phenomenon everywhere and always. Uh, I believe that real estate cycles that are significant and serious are uh, debt uh, problems. And then the so the question is, what do we do about the debt generators and about the banking system? So in um, the response in Europe and in the United States in the Dodd-Frank um, Dodd Act here, the response has been one of um, better, uh, a clear response, two responses, one macroprudential and the other uh, to shut down insolvent institutions. So shutting down insolvent institutions, in a moment I'll come back to how that is being thought about, uh, and also shutting down insolvent institutions and putting into place tools such as loan to value and other macroprudential uh, as the um, bubble uh, worsens and to stop the bubble is really the hope for the future. So, uh, good, Charles Goodhart, uh, Oliver Hart, and Luigi Sigalis uh, have a very important paper which points to the dangerous nature of the downward credit cycle and the cause of credit to shut off and therefore the need through cocoa bonds, for example, which um, are a uh, bond that goes from debt to equity um, <clears throat> as, the, um, as the credit cycle and real estate cycle worsen, thus incentivizing a group of private sector investors to oversee, to monitor the growing cycle in the same way that the bond vigilantes uh, did for inflation. Um, so um, that, they, that the, the cocoa bond holders uh, would, in fact, follow the credit and real estate cycle. Um, <clears throat> the problem, however, is that, the, that banks and the financial industry in general is a, a problem of moral hazard and the ability to uh, gamble for resurrection. And that's a problem that shareholders are very much aware of. So shareholders themselves may be gambling for, re uh, for resurrection. So in such a case, institutions and solvencies is not known until too late because the uh, insiders, the managers, and even the shareholders are pushing for gambling for re resurrection once they put options in the money. So we must know, regulators and investors must have enough information about each company's assets and the overall book to business to assess uh, liquidity and solvency risk before the bubble becomes so obvious uh, that um, it's just too late. So there, uh, and, and more than that, we need to have thresholds. So we need to have tools that trigger not discretionary, but in fact rule-based implementation of macroprudential rules. All of this is not simple. Uh, they're necessary to properly, uh, for proper implementation of macroprudential policies, therefore, is information, 
monitoring information, and the research beforehand to know what information it is that we need to monitor. We are in the infancy of developing research and tools, so this debate will continue for some time. Uh, but it is evidence of progress that we have learned from our failure. Uh, obviously, this is not this learning will not prevent the business cycle or ever achieve perfectly efficient asset pricing. That's not the goal. Uh, if we use uh, this emerging uh, research and these emerging tools wisely um, to support not only monetary stability but financial policy goals, uh, we will have learned our lesson from this past financial crisis. Thank you very much. Right, uh...